D D D D DJ DJ Double Double It's DJ Double right here and today I am sat right here with the Grammy nominated future hey. king of R and B hey. Ro James What's in the up, building. Bro? What's up, man? I'm alright, bro. How are you? I'm fantastic. Good yeah. stuff, man. Good stuff. Now, if anyone said to me, like, who's Ro James? Mm -hmm. I would say he's a mixture between Maxwell and Prince. Hmm. Okay. That's what I would put out there personally. Now, um, I know I know there's there's especially the Prince comparison. Yeah. It's something that you've had probably a billion times already in your career. Is it something that you're sick of hearing yet, or is it still a compliment? Uh, I think it's a compliment. Um, I believe Prince is an amazing artist. I feel like he's uh, one of the iconic artists of our time, and mm -hmm. I feel like um, it's uh, definitely a compliment. Um, but at the same time, any artist, I feel like a real artist, doesn't want to really be compared to anybody. You know what I mean? I think comparisons are basically so people can uh feel comfortable or generalize you right. so it fits into their mind of who you're like so oh yeah i like him because he's like versus saying yo i like him because he's different or yeah, he's yeah, because yeah. he's him you know so but i understand the comparison thing and i'm not offended by it so because i feel like it gives people a a point of how to connect to me uh -huh. so it's cool yeah. yeah how would you describe your sound to a complete stranger how would i describe my sound uh my sound of music is soul, for sure. I'll say that. Um, but I feel like when you say soul, it's, it's generally older. You always associate soul music mm -hmm. with, like, dated. yeah, dated. And you feel like that's, like, urban AC or 35, 40, 45-year-old. Yeah, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. That's your dem demographic. When I feel like all music that we listen to basically is grounded in soul, any music that involve singing uh -huh. it should start from the soul you know yeah, what i mean yeah, yeah. and i so i said that's why i say soul but i feel like my sound is actually eclectic because i pull so many different sounds together from country rock r&b hip-hop mm -hmm. soul gospel a little bit of reggae you know what i mean so it's just a lot of different things so yeah my sound is uh unique unique yeah, <laughs> yeah. most definitely now uh, I, i've done a lot of reading about you and there's a few things i came across i wanted to ask is it true that when you were younger, one day your dad came in the house and threw out all the music in the house. Everything. Every so he literally came in, took all the records and threw it out. Gone. Yeah. Crazy. Talk to me. <laughs> like, what, what happened there? Well, my father, um, he got into church and he someone, I guess my uncle, I, I can't remember the, how it started for him, but I mean, somebody came to him and basically introduced him to God and Christ right. and religion, basically. And in religion, they tell you, you know, there's a lot of things that uh, material things that take you away from God. Right, so okay. for him, he was told that going into movies and smoking cigarettes and watching music videos and uh, music that you listen to right, okay. would take you further away from God. For him, as a new Christian, as a new believer, he thought that, you know, he had to do all of these things. So he came right. home and threw it all out without thinking like. This has nothing to do with that, you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's more than that. So, yeah, when I was young, I was like, what the hell, man? Yeah, <laughs> well, I don't know how I would react to that. Yeah, it's, it was different. So, <laughs> your musical influences, at what age was that? Do you remember? I can't. Uh, I would say about nine, ten. So, your there. musical influences from nine onwards were, were what exactly? I mean, so obviously... So, church is about music as yeah. well so was it gospel music or it was a lot of gospel music for sure <laughs> but i mean he what he did do is he introduced us and also allowed us to listen to like the greats like stevie wonder and marvin gay oh, okay, otis right, redding right, right. sam cook like old so school artists it wasn't all bad but <laughs> think about being a, a, a young guy in and you, you're not relating to the music that people or else, everybody else yeah. is listening to because you can't listen to it. Mm -hmm. But you're over here talking about Donnie Hathaway and Stevie Wonder. Everybody's like, what? What are you talking about? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But what it did, it gave me a sense of soul. It gave me a sense of um, learning how to use my voice. And all right. of them have voices. And it also gave me a perspective on writing and what to write about, content, stuff, uh, content and topics that actually had reason, you know what I mean? And music mm -hmm. that could last forever, classic music. And so as I started to come up, that's what I wanted to create, classic music that would last forever, that spoke about love and relationships and life. 
but what I did find was that all my songs were about relationships because all those be- it was like all right, I gotta break out of that but yeah, yeah. <laughs> so would you say like I mean it sounds like that decision by your dad really did steer your musical path especially into your career with the type of music that yeah. you make because I was interested to know whether you then were influenced by the music that you were exposed to or if you kind of rebelled a bit and like you know what I've had this my whole life I don't want to do this anymore mm-hmm. and then go go left completely mm-hmm. you know so I, I, was, I was interested to know that I think that when you're nine ten years old and you can't listen to certain music it's like you think it's devastating but at the same time you're only nine ten years old so it's <laughs> like you got to do what your parents say so yeah. for me i embraced it i feel until i was about 14 15 and i started to rebel and do my own thing listen to the music that i wanted to listen to i would hide cds i would uh <laughs> like hide cds in the air conditioner van i mean <laughs> Then I got my first car. So, you know, I had ways of listening to and doing what I wanted to do, but I definitely rebelled. But I also will agree that it definitely gave me balance Mm. and steered uh, my perception of music and what real music is and what good music is, what chord changes are, what harmonies are, you know, or how to, you know, belt or how to actually tap into yourself and have emotion with what you're saying and how, you know what I mean? So it gave me that perspective. So I'm grateful for that balance. What point did you start taking music seriously? When were you like, this is the direction, like this is where we're going now? Uh, I was 19 when I started like take it seriously, seriously. I mean, I, when I was 16 was the first time I had been into a studio. And my older cousin, he has had a studio right. and he invited me. He knew I could sing and he was like, okay. come check it out. Hear what your voice sounds like being recorded. So I did it. And I think that's what sparked it for me. The curiosity and that's the right, interest. The yeah, right. yeah, it, it was the seed. And then from there, 19 was when I wrote my first like song, recorded my first song. So it all started for me at 19. You make what I would definitely call grown folk music. Yeah, I'll take that. It's um very different to what is out there right now. Yeah. Now, is that something that you do naturally or have you kind of looked at the landscape and thought, you know what, this sound is missing. I want to go this direction and fill that niche. Or is it just, is this Ro James sound? This is Ro James, and but I feel like... Um my sound is comprised of so many different things. Like I said, country, rock, R&B, hip hop. So I feel like on a first project, you can't give everything that you got in one take because everybody, they're already bored, you know what I mean? So as I enroll, you know, unravel, I feel like I'm gonna expose and introduce different feels to what I am inspired by. I did look into the music industry and see uh, someone, one of my uh, executives at the label who said, you know, you got to fill the void. You got to look and see what's missing and fill the bo- void. And I had already known that that was important. You don't go into somewhere and copy somebody or no. do what's already there because it's already existent. Not too many people at the label or not too many labels really invest mm-hmm. in R&B because yeah, money. the money, they feel like, but you know what, I feel like if you put the money behind it and make an artist, like say, yo, this is the the new mold of what R&B, put the money behind it, I feel like Prince, D- Donny Hathaway, Stevie, uh, Jodeci, D'Angelo, uh, Usher, these other people, they put money behind them for them to be where they are, for them to be even recognized as icon because you have to be exposed to people. Yeah. You know what I mean? So uh, I did definitely feel a void because I feel like R&B was a part and is a part of my upbringing, but it's not all that I am. I'm not right. only R&B, but for, to fill the void, I feel like I created an album that felt filled the void yeah, of R&B. Yeah, definitely, man. Most yeah. definitely. I didn't, I'll be honest, I didn't really, I wasn't onto you before you got signed. Word. So when I heard Permission was the first time that I was I was exposed to you as, a, yeah. as an artist. Did you spend long as an independent artist? I spent, uh, okay, so I'll say I've spent about maybe 10 plus years so you've been here, like, hustling, you've been doing working. it. Yeah, yeah. But I, I had been helping other people in the music industry. Right advice like style wise uh, just different ways of moving around in the music industry until i started to realize that i was offering advice and it was working and it, i was the same thing like i'm an artist too like but i felt like i wasn't ready so i was helping other people just so i could learn the business right, so i could okay. figure out the landscape of what it was what not to do what to do what mistakes to avoid you know and then uh so about three years ago Going on four, I released my first project, Coke Jack and Cadillacs, and that right. was my entry point. When you first release something into the world to where they can critique it or judge it or listen to it or compare or to even relate. 
you know, so I feel like Coke Jack and Cadillacs opened up the door for me to be able to just be me. Mm-hmm. You get what I mean? Definitely. So. How has the grind changed for you from being an independent, <coughs> excuse me, an independent artist to now being signed to a major? The grind? Uh, the grind does not stop. Let's <laughs> 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 say that. It gets more and more, but I feel like... Uh, when you're independent, you have to work ten times more. I mean, to be honest, man, both both ways you have to work ten times more. Independent, mm-hmm. you got to work hard as hell. Yeah. Because it's you. You represent yourself and whoever you recruit to to help you get to where you're trying to go. Um, but you have this freedom. You have yeah. no restrictions. You have no, no creative, no release schedule. Yeah. No, you don't have to accept creative advice from anybody. You don't have to accept creative critique. It's yours. This mm-hmm. is my work. This is my art. You don't like it go look at the next one you know what i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. whereas with you when you're with a label you kind of like have a whole staff of people who have you. different opinions and different ideas and different creative and different places that they've been so they are trying to give you an advice on your life on what you feel on what you see on the colors that you see with your painting but you have never lived my life mm-hmm. but at the same time with the label you have to now welcome those opinions because you're with a team now yeah, and you yeah, want yeah. to grow for the benefit of the world. You want to share your 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 talent with the world. So it's like, okay, now I have to kind of compromise and listen to these people. But then you realize, yo, it's all about me. Like if I don't get the inspiration, if I'm not cre- creating based off of what I feel honestly, mm-hmm. I can't get on that stage and actually perform it because it's not real. I'm doing it because someone else wants me to do it. You know what I mean? There's certain people that can do that, but I feel like I can't connect that way. Mm -hmm. So back to what you were saying, the grind, I feel like it's definitely changed because you learn more about the business. You learn uh, more about your money. You learn more about the art and how to get around certain aspects of the business. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I think the grind is continuous though, independent or with a major it's just a different grind yeah it's a different (laughs) grind all the same though having been working now in in music for over 10 years like you said what's the the biggest obstacle that you found you had to overcome that was one of the biggest obstacles i feel like uh transition transitioning from independent to major wasn't that hard i feel like i had the right team i got mark pitts who's over there at rca uh who is great um man the start hardest dropping names part. in case you start in case you forget someone. <laughs> no, I'm just trying to think what was the hardest part about the the part like It really wasn't that hard. The hardest part I will say like is is accepting other people's advice. I feel like I'm super mm-hmm. creative. I already know what I want, how I want it, what it looks like. It's just about finding the people to make me help me get it out. Not tell me Nah, you shouldn't use purple. You should use neon green. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense to me. It doesn't fit. It doesn't Mm -hmm. go with what I see in my head. How about we figure out how to make this shit purple? (laughs) You know what I mean? And it's like, (laughs) that's the hardest thing is just trying to make people get on board with your vision and get outside of whatever their agenda is. You get what I mean? Yeah, man. Most definitely. Most definitely. Um, So, like I say, Permission was the first record that really switched me on to Roe James. And Word. I feel that way in terms of like a more mainstream audience in the UK, it's the same. Word. Obviously there were people that found your first project yeah. and were onto you from day one. Um, was it the same in the States? Do you think Permission was like the, the breakthrough record for you? Yeah, I think Permission opened the door. Um, there's a lot of underground, like you said, people who, who already knew what I was doing and mm-hmm. had heard my last project, but Permission, was like the mainstream release to where more people got the opportunity to hear me. Um, it was a radio hit. It came on the radio. It's still on the radio right now, yeah, still on yeah, the charts, yeah. which is great. You know, um, it get, got me my first Grammy nomination. I mean, so many different things. I got to go on tour with Maxwell, Mary J. Blige, Erica Badu, like so many different things that came from just that. So I feel like, yeah, it opened the door, but it's just a piece of who I am. Right. Yeah, you yeah. get what I mean? So. Can you pinpoint a specific time when you were like, I'm really blowing up? Like, was there a moment that you realized it was really happening? You know what's crazy? I I know where I want to be. I know where I want to go. I know I see myself there. Mm-hmm. So when 
blowing up, I feel like I'm not even, I haven't even scratched the surface. You right, get what okay. I mean? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I know what you're saying, but I feel like, okay, where you, you're saying basically where people started to recognize me for my for my music, for my what I do. Mm-hmm. Uh, whew, man, um, I used to live in Indiana. So when I went to Indiana, the first time uh, to promote the single, and they did like a little radio show for me, and it was packed out and it was people like screaming and I was like, wait a minute, this is crazy. <laughs> That's kind of like the first feeling like, all right, this is where I used to live. These people are here because they know I used to live here and a lot of people are here to support because they've seen me grind and leave this place and go to where I want to be and actually make it and work hard. So it was like, just to see all those people, it was like, ah, this is really working, you know what I mean? And then to go back home to New York and to see kind of the same response, it's like, not even kind of, to see the same feel, the same response, it's like, all right, it's working. People are starting to yeah. understand. People are starting to tap in, but I still feel like I got years of work, man, because even when you look at Pharrell, like, look, he's been doing this for how many years? Yeah, about 400. <laughs> 400 years. <laughs> 400 years. He's a vampire. Because he yeah, still yeah. look young, bro. <laughs> but he's yeah. been doing it forever, and I feel like there's still people that are just now getting to know that Pharrell exists in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With happy. Mm-hmm. You get what I mean? So it's just, like, interesting because you, you're continuously hustling. You're continuously grinding for more people to know who you are, to tap into what you do. Now people are going back, listening to his old music, like, wow, he's dope. But I'm like, he's been around doing this. Yeah. So you're working. You just, you know. You mentioned that you were on tour with Maxwell and Mary J. Word. How was that? I mean, I, do I even need to ask how that was really? Nah, not really. <laughs> now, lived, up, lived up to expectations? It was great. It exceeded my expectations. I feel like I learned so much just from that. And that being my first major tour mm. put me in a great place mentally and even as an artist with perspective about team, how to run my band, uh, how to run a tour, just seeing how management should run, seeing how artists should protect his voice or protect take his moment. You know, I'm so, mm-hmm. so chill that I just before I would probably just go and do a show land and go do a show whereas you yeah. learn like you can't really land and go do a show you're changing your area you change you know so many different things um I learned a lot from Maxwell as far as like show to showmanship and just uh speaking to him about the industry and right. where he's been for 20 years and how he's preserved and maintained and uh, kept his artistic integrity, you know what I mean, and respect. And so, you know, he's given me great advice and just made sure that I kept it about the music, you know, and more so took me under his wing as like a big brother and kind of like, yo, this is this is who you deal with, this is who you don't deal with. Don't do this, don't do that. Make sure you stay straight and just make sure you focus on the music, keep it about the music, you know. And uh, Mary J. Blige, too, just watching her, got some great advice from her as well to go on stage and make sure I kill it every day. Like, Mm -hmm. it's my last performance, you know, and I watched her do that, fall on the ground. She's incredible. Yeah, soulful, man. And Yeah, so, I mean, just those little tidbits of information and advice I feel like I've kept it and I'm still learning to apply it because to be able to get up there and be completely vulnerable and free and to throw yourself on the stage or out into the crowd is a different level of performing you know so yeah 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 yeah. but I've learned so much from them Amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, con- congratulations on El Dorado, the Word, album, man. by the way. Thank you. That's a very good entry point for like a debut album. Perfect. That's exactly. Yeah. That's an amazing statement to make, like with the music that was there. Just, yeah, incredible, man. Thank it you, really man. Was, um, were you were you happy with how it was received and like the, the figures? Do, do you really even care about that kind of the stuff? numbers and whatnot? Yeah. Um, I was happy with the way i'm happy with the way that it is being perceived Mm -hmm. i feel like we are still stuck on permission we're still in the first single and there's so many songs on the album that i feel like deserve to be heard deserve light deserve to have the opportunity for people to hear it that way they can also see what else i'm capable of doing you know on this first album i really wanted to come in and let people know for one i'm about real music for one I could do pretty much anything. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Don't box me in. El Dorado was my first car, and it represents the beginning of my journey. It represents the ride, you know? And uh, 
as my first car. This is my first album too. We still have a lot of work to do promoting it because people are just now realizing I even have an album out. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> you know, what's your favorite song from the album? All of them. <laughs> I don't oh, really. I like all of them because like all, all of them have a specific meaning and they 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 mean what they mean to me. But I feel like as a person listening to it on the outside, it can mean something to someone at the same way. I hear every day someone says a, a certain song is their favorite song. Mm -hmm. One of the ones for me that stands out is Holy Water because I feel like it. Uh, it's bigger than just R and B. It's mm -hmm. it it encompasses all of the different genres. I said country, rock, R and B, soul a little bit of hip-hop world is for the world i don't feel like it has a genre it puts me in a place to where you can't box me in and that's exactly the type of artist i want to be just free creating real music you can't box me but at the same time being honest emotional true you know holy Wars talks about the journey everybody in life everybody each one of us are on our own individual journeys whatever we want to do with ourselves you doing what you do my boy she uh, me we all do what we do and we go through these different obstacles in life on our journey you know relationships highs lows and that's what El Dorado is it's highs and lows but holy water is that exactly it speaks about the road and how to realize no matter what you go through it's only to make you stronger you mm -hmm. know so yeah I think my my favorite song off the album's got to be burn slow hey you know what the whole album when I was listening to it, I was like, if I if I set up a Spotify playlist, yeah, like and labeled it "sexy time," you know, you know you're good I mean? time, you're good money. Push it play. would be the <laughs> the whole album. Yeah, <laughs> you could push play and you're good. Exactly. Yeah. Um. What? <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> One thing I noticed there was no collaborations. Yeah. So that was clearly a conscious decision from you. Absolutely. So talk talk to me about what point were you like? Because I mean, being with a, the label you're at. I could have had a, a, yeah. a left row of yeah, artists that yeah. you could have had on there. Mm -hmm. So to be like, no, nah, I'm cool, I'm going to do this. Like, what was behind that decision? Uh, I wanted to come into the music industry without, so to speak, shining on someone else's sun. Like, I feel like a lot of people that I could have collaborated are, are big. They already have their name. They already have whatever. And I feel like a lot of people, I didn't want people to come and say, yo, I like Ro James because he has that song with Future. Mm -hmm. And it's like... No, you like Ro James because you like his music first. And yeah. uh, I felt like that was important for me to come in on my own footing to say, yo, this is me. This is what I sound like. This is what my voice sounds like. This is what I can do. This is what I'm about. This is the entry point. Now, next project, let's see who else. You know, and it, it's more organic. It's real because then whoever I decide to collaborate with can see the benefit and the value of collaborating with someone who is authentically themselves. Mm -hmm. And is about real music or if you know if you want to collaborate with me now you can actually say yo i i can i appreciate what he does let's see what we can do together versus saying i don't really know what you do but i'm just gonna hop in this song and hope that i can make some bread from it you get what i mean yeah. so yeah who would be your ultimate collaboration i don't think i even need to ask i think i know i know this dead or alive who would it be let me hear what you got to say i reckon you'd say prince i would love man Prince would have been an amazing collaboration. I think we'd have done some great music, but uh, time played different, you know, and uh, I thank him for his inspiration. However, there are amazing other creators out here still. <laughs> like, uh, for one that I can't wait to work with is Andre 3000. I think that I like his his creative mind. I like what he does. I appreciate what he, where he's been career wise, and I've watched him from Outkast to being into his own artist to just falling away from the music industry and really focusing on his art and not really being about, you know what I mean? So I appreciate him as an artist. Uh, there's so many people though: Kanye, J Cole, uh, Future, Travis Scott. There's like a, a lot of people I would love to work with. Yeah, definitely, man. All right, so we've reached the promised land. We're yes. Run through a couple of real quick questions before we wrap up. What's up? This is called the fun bit. Oh man, bro, James, you ready for the fun bit? Let's go. All right, so what's the last book you ever read? Uh, the last book I ever read. Uh, Silent Power was the last book I just read. Okay, I've never heard of it. But. See, you got to read it, man. And Silent Power is like more of a, um, it's like a spiritual. I think it just helps you to see your path and kind of realize where you're at and what you're doing and how to to reel it in and to actually see where you're going. You know what I mean? There's so many things and experiences that we have. Mm -hmm. I just was praying for a second. <laughs> <laughs> and so many experiences we have had, and I feel like Silent Power 
it speaks in just that the silent power of yourself knowing who you are and how to walk in the knowledge of your confidence i think mean, it's kind of deep but yeah it seems to be working for you man hey man what's the worst job you ever had worst job i ever had yo you want to know the worst job i've ever had i worked at mcdonald's no one Say ever no knows more. that. <laughs> hey, but you know, no, no, no. I was a, I was in high school, and there was this like a uh, thing called DECA, and we had to do like we got to leave school at twelve o'clock noon, but you had to work like ten hours a week. So I knew some people at McDonald's, so I got like a management job at sixteen, making like fifteen dollars an hour mm. for ten hours. A week. So oh, okay. Blah blah blah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, last dream you remember having? Last dream I remember having. Um. That's a good one, man. I can't remember offhand. Wow. Last dream I remember having is this one, bro, that I was going to be doing this shit right here, and I'm actually this, this doing it. You made it, bro. This right here. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me briefly about the time you bought pizza for your whole class. For my whole class? <laughs> man, I was a young boy, <laughs> and my teacher had pissed me off one day. And uh, I remember leaving the the locker room, and I saw his bag there, and the wallet was there, and I took it, and I bought pizza for everyone in the cafeteria, like balling, <laughs> bought pizza for everyone, and that's what caught me, what got me caught, because it's like, yeah, all right, my wallet's missing, and this kid is over here buying pizza for everybody <laughs> in the whole school. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty interesting. Yeah, I got it's suspended. Dope, it's like some Robin Hood stuff. You know what I mean? So the last one. Before the Illuminati conspiracy theorists uh -huh. grab hold of this and run with it, what is XIX? <laughs> they are going to try to run with it. Them symbols right. I see everywhere now. See, XIX represents the number 19. Right. So 19 so is Roman numerals, then, yeah. Roman numerals for 19, and that's when I started. I started when I was 19 years old. It represents my beginning um, of my career, you know, uh, and where I'm going. My gra So many things happened at 19. First song, first love, first heartbreak. My grandfather died like deciding to actually do this making the move from living in indiana to moving to new york city to actually go hard with pursuing my dream so it just represents my beginning A magic number for yeah you. you know 19 I'm, I'm about numbers too so you know number 19 is it's changed like right before change so yeah mm -hmm. yeah amazing it's been a pleasure bro hey man likewise bro. thanks so much for sitting down with me you got it dj double here with ro james hey